Galatians 2, 15 to 21. We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Our children stay upstairs today for church. Thank you. What a privilege it is, again, to just bring the word to this congregation. Um, the love I just have for this congregation and just the opportunity to always bring the word is a privilege on my end. Um, I want to begin with an illustration that a man gave that I think fits our text well this morning. He said, there was a man in England who put his Rolls Royce on a boat and went across the continent to go on a vacation. While he was driving around Europe, something happened to the motor of his car. He called the Rolls Royce people back in England and asked, I'm having trouble with my car. What do you suggest I do? Well, the Rolls Royce people immediately flow, flew a mechanic over. The mechanic repaired the car and then they flew back to England and left the man to continue his vacation. Now, as you can imagine, this man was wondering, how much is this going to cost me? So when he got back to England, he wrote the people a letter, and he asked, how much do I owe you? He received a letter from an office that read this, Dear Sir, there is no record anywhere in our files that anything ever went wrong with the Rolls Royce. Brothers and sisters, that illustration this morning is a beautiful picture of our justification. The problem with the motor is our sin, and God comes along and takes care of our sin freely through Jesus' death. So before we begin our text, I want to go over what justification is. Justification is a legal declaration made by God where God declares a person to be righteous because of their faith in Jesus. I've heard many people put it like this, and I know I first heard it from Pastor. I know he likes to put it like this, that to remember justification is God treats me just as if I've never sinned. And so I want us to think about that. However, God's forgiveness is only one part of our justification, because if God just forgave us of our sin, we'd be left in a neutral state before him. So God not only forgives our sins, but he also imputes Christ's righteousness to us. So one day, if you have placed your faith in Christ, one day you will stand before the judgment seat of God. And God will not see your sin, but he will see the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so this means this morning, you're in one of two categories as you're listening. You either have placed your faith in Jesus, he is your righteousness, or you have placed your faith in something that will never justify you before God. So before we begin going through our text, examine for yourself which category you're in as you listen. And my prayer for you this morning is one of two things. For those 
who have never believed in the Lord Jesus to save them from their sins, that you would do business with God today. Because it will be a scary day before the judgment seat of God if you are standing with your own righteousness. And for those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray this doctrine of justification would cause you to marvel at the goodness of our God yet again, that he would save a lowly sinner as yourself, that he would treat a sinner as yourself as if you never sinned, that he imputes Christ's righteousness onto us. And so last time when we were together in Galatians 2, 11 through 14, we looked at Paul's com- confrontation of Peter. And Paul confronts Peter because of his fear of man. Specifically, when the Judaizers came to visit the church, they caused Peter to withdraw from eating with the Gentiles because they did not adhere to the Mosaic law. So Peter began to act hypocritically, and many of the church members, and the God's word says even Barnabas, began to act hypocritically along with Paul. And so Paul tells them that they, their conduct was out of line with the truth of the gospel. And so that's the context where we pick up today in verse 15. Paul is addressing the Galatian church in light of what Paul, of what Peter has just done. So we start in verse 15 where Paul says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Now when I was studying this, this sounds strange when you first read it because you might think, Paul, how come you're calling the Gentiles sinners but not the Jews? In other words, we know Paul theologically uh, saw all people as sinners before God. Just last week, Jose preached on Romans 3 where we see, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So what is Paul trying to say here? And I believe Paul is being a little sarcastic and two reasons for that. One, the Jews would refer to anyone that did not adhere to the Mosaic law as sinners, even though they themselves were hypocrites and they didn't follow the law. Two, the word to describe the Gentiles here that we see sinners is the same word Paul uses to describe the Jews in verse 17. So Paul believes in the sinfulness of all people. He believes that we all have missed the mark, even his Jewish brethren. And since this is the case, Paul tells us what the solution to our problem, sin is, in the next verse. He says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. That JBF is just justified by faith. It, it wouldn't fit on the slide. So <laughs> justification by faith, the first thing I want us to see is it saves us. Paul makes it clear in this verse that no one will be justified apart from faith in Jesus. And the reason for that is none of us have obeyed God perfectly. If you look at God's law, we have broken God's law not only once, even though James tells us even if you've broken it once, you've broken it all. And so we know as we live our days, we have disobeyed God plenty. And so it would only be possible to stand before a holy God justified if you kept the law perfectly, without one blemish. Even secular people recognize this, right? If you talk to any person that doesn't believe in God, they'll even say, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. People mess up. And so we all know in, uh, just inside of us that by our conscience that we mess up. And we are sinners before God. And this is why faith in Jesus is required to be justified. Because he's the only person, God incarnate, that came and lived a perfect life. 
And Paul goes to great measure here, as you see in this verse, to make sure we're not confused about what saves us. If you look, Paul tells us uh, the general truth that a man is not justified by works of the law. He tells us the personal truth. We have believed in Jesus. We may be justified. And I love that Paul always does that. If you look at many of Paul's letters, he always makes sure to include himself as a sinner in need of God's grace. He knew that he was a wretched sinner and that he was the chief of sinners. So he made sure to always include himself. And then there's a universal truth that no flesh will be justified. So it almost feels like Paul could have just said the last part, right? No one will be justified by works of the law. And I feel like we all would have got what he was saying. However, I think Paul understood it's in our human nature to trust ourselves. It's in our human nature to try to earn our way into heaven by our own merit. And if you don't believe me, try a little bit of evangelism. Go out into the streets, ask people if you were to stand before God today, and God said, why should I let you into heaven? See what the answers are that they give you. I bet you the floodgates of, well, I'm a good person, I gave to the poor, I took care of my kids, I paid my taxes, on and on and on with ways that we should be accepted before God. And so people will give all types of answers that basically are saying, well, my good outweighs my bad is what they're trying to get at. And so they don't see the sinfulness of their selves. So what I want you to tell you today, brothers and sisters, is the only sufficient answer anyone can give that would allow them to enter heaven is to point to the man seated at the right hand of God that died on the cross for sinners. There's only one way into heaven. What does Jesus tell us in John 14, 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And I think our culture hates this, don't they? Because as Jose talked about last week, we want to hold up this your truth, my truth doctrine, right? The idea that all roads lead to glory. And when we look at the gospel, the gospel is a message of exclusivity. There is only one way, and it's through the Son of God. Also, as we look at these verses, we are not just justified by faith in a set of facts. It is a belief that a real person named Jesus Christ came and died for my sins. What saves you is a personal trust in him to save you. So let me ask, do you know him? Or are you still trusting in your own righteousness as you come before God? I love how uh, Charles Spurgeon puts it on this doctrine. He says, this is the primary truth to be proclaimed by Christian ministry. It is the foundation and stone of all gospel preaching. And yet, somehow or other, such is the hardness of human heart that it is the most difficult thing to induce our hearers to build on this foundation. Many of them are always trying to lean upon their own works, so struggling to get back under the old legal dispensation instead of rejoicing in the liberty of dispensation of grace. So in Spurgeon's day, in Paul's day, in our day, throughout all human histo history, people gravitate toward trying to be justified by God by their own works instead of accepting the free gift of salvation that God offers to sinners. And, you know, I can't go into all details of this time in history, but this was the heart of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther, John Calvin, many other the reformers saw an issue with the Roman Catholic Church because they adopted many doctrines which were not actually found in Scripture. One of those doctrines is Paul's point here. How is a person saved? What, what declares a person righteous in the eyes of God? And the, former, the reformers came up with what we call today five solas, which were essential doctrines that Christians must believe. 
And amongst the five is the doctrine called sola fide, which means we are saved by faith alone. And so the Protestant Reformation was a protest in which the reformers stood with Paul in saying we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And I think this is what Paul is speaking of in this verse. And it's still the battle we fight today. Like I said, if you were to go and evangelize, you would see why this scripture still is relevant to today. Because there are people, most people in this world, think that they can be justified before God by the works that they do. So Christ is the only way you and I have hope to be justified before a holy God. One of the Puritans, John Flavel, put it like this. Did Christ finish his work? How dangerous, how dangerous is it, it is to join anything of our, own, of our own to the righteousness of Christ in pursuit of justification before God. Jesus Christ will never endure this. It reflects upon his work dishonorably. He will be all or none in our justification. If he has finished the work, what need is there of our additions? And if not, to what purpose are they? Can we finish that which Christ himself could not complete? Did he finish the work? And will he ever divide the glory and praise of it with us? No. No. Christ is no half savior. It is a hard thing to bring proud hearts to rest upon Christ for righteousness. God humbles the proud by calling sinners holy from their own righteousness to Christ for their justification. So brothers and sisters, you're either with Christ or you're not. You're either with him or against him. There's not an in between that to get to the father. And you know, we're getting ready to celebrate the death of Jesus this Friday. And as Jesus hung on the cross, right before he died, he took his last breath. And we know what he said. He said, it is finished. And as we think about that, some people just think his suffering's finished. His pain is finished. The things he had to endure on the cross and from the people that crucified him is finished. But Jesus is saying so much more than that. He's saying the work is complete. The payment has been paid. And so all that is left is, will you trust that? Will we trust his work is complete on the cross? And you know, this is not a, just a struggle for believers, I mean unbelievers. This is a struggle for believers. And I know this because when I was uh, younger in my faith, you know how many times I raised my hand for a sinner's prayer? You know how many times I bowed my head and asked God to save me? And what I failed to understand during those times is the reason I'm justified has nothing to do with my works. I'm justified because Jesus' death and his resurrection, he is my righteousness. And guess what? If our righteousness depended on us, we'd all be in hell. And so... Let's listen to some biblical men on this doctrine of justification. They helped me as I was studying it. Um, first from John Bunyan, he says, Indeed, this is, the, this is one of the greatest mysteries in the world, namely that a righteous that resides with a person in heaven should justify me, a sinner on earth. I hope you stop often and praise God for treating you as if you never sinned. Also from John MacArthur, justification is a completed fact for the believer. It is not an ongoing process. Brothers and sisters, when you're justified, the work is complete already. You don't have to keep going back and asking Jesus to save you. Once he saves you, that is over. You are justified. Thomas Watson says, God does not justify us because we are worthy, but by us by justifying us, makes us worthy. There was nothing in you that caused God's hand to justify you. It was because of his gr uh, great love. It was entirely by his grace that he justifies you. And then Martin Luther said, 
Night and day, I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement that the just shall live by his faith. Then I grasped that the justice of God is that the righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us through faith. Thereupon, I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. Brothers and sisters, justification by faith alone saves us. Do you believe that? And even as you go throughout your day as a believer, do you function as if that's the case? That I am justified by faith alone? Or every time when you come before God's throne of grace, are you, do you question your salvation? Am I even saved? And of course, as we look at the next verse, Paul anticipates an objection. In verse 17, he says, But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. As I study out this verse, there was actually many interpretations to what this means. I only found two that were viable, but I'm just going to go over the one that I felt fits the context well for the sake of time. I believe what Paul is saying here is a Jew will come along and say, I'm going to be justified in Christ, and as I'm coming to be justified, I'm found as a sinner, just like a Gentile. And I could hear Paul saying, yep, you're exactly right. You're found a sinner. You need grace. But then they say that makes Christ a minister to sin, to which Paul would emphatically say here, may it never be. And I think this is really a misunderstanding of their law on their end, because if you read in God's word, the law was never meant to justify us. We're going to look in chapter uh, 3. And also, as you read just through the New Testament, when we learn about Abraham, what does it say Abraham was justified by? His faith. And so works of the law was never meant to justify us. But the law was to show us our sinful state. Because when we look at the law, what we see is, wow, I can't keep this. I keep falling. I keep sinning. And then what that should do is, not have you soak in self-despair, but it shows you your need to depend on Jesus for his grace. And so we're all in the same boat when we stand before God. We are sinners in need of a savior. And Paul reveals the danger of going back. He says, for if I, for if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. If you read through the book of Hebrews, which I'm no expert in it, um, two things that I believe it teaches is Christ is a better sacrifice and Christ is a better high priest. And so you'll often read in the book of Hebrews, don't go back to the old way. Christ is the perfect sacrifice. Christ is our better high priest. And I believe Paul is telling the Jews here, if they go back to the law, after the discovering the truth of justification in Christ, then you go back to just being a sinner again. You go back to just being stand, uh, standing condemned before God because that's what the law is, will do. It will condemn. And in this context with Peter compelling the Gentiles to live like Jews, he's doing just that, right? You can see why Paul is so passionate about this because it's at the very heart of the gospel. That's why when you read in scripture, Paul can say, hey, whether you're Greek, whether you're Jew, whether you're circumcised, whether you're uncircumcised, whether you're barbarian, whether you're Scythian, whether you're slave, whether you're free, we are all sinners and there's no other way to be justified than in Christ alone. So Paul in the next few verses um, is gonna, we're justified by faith. He shows us that. That's what saves us. And then Paul, in the next few verses, fights against the idea, I think, that justification means we just live lawless. And the, so the point he makes is justification by faith not only save us, 
but I think justification by faith also enables us. Listen to these verses again. For through the law, I died to the law so that I may live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Now, these verses, especially verse 20, are some of the most glorious verses in all of Scripture. People have spent many passages, I mean, many messages just unpacking in depth of all it means that we live to God and we are crucified with Christ. Let's start with what does it mean that we die to the law? John Calvin says, to die to the law is to renounce it, to be freed from its dominion. So that way we have no confidence in it and it does not hold us captive under the yoke of its slavery. I want you to think, because this is a lang court language that we're hearing when we hear justification. If you were to stand before a judge and you were convicted of a crime and, the, uh, and you were executed, the law at that point has no further claim on you. And it's the same with the Christian. When, when, uh, when we die in Christ, justice has been satisfied. You are freed from the penalty that sin could bring now. Let's meditate on these verses in Romans 8 that has this same language. He said, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, he will not, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Then listen to this language. Who will bring a charge against God as elect? And so if you were standing in court and you were the one being prosecuted, who will bring a charge against you? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Brothers and sisters, we have Jesus Christ in heaven interceding for, on our behalf. And there will, never be, there will never be a charge brought against you. There will never be condemnation on your life if you place your faith in Christ, uh, Jesus Christ. You read Romans 8, and it begins with, there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. And then it ends with, nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That is the promise that we get to hold on, that nothing will separate us from that love and nothing will condemn us any longer because of our faith in him. So the penalty has been paid. There's nothing that will be brought against you that can condemn you. We're alive to God. As we look at verse 20, there are three what I would call benefits for the believer in verse 20 that I think enables us. One, he says, I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. One, we are united to Christ in his death. Those who know Greek inform us when Paul says, I am cruci crucified in Christ, he is saying that in the perfect tense, which means what he's saying is, I have been crucified and I remain crucified to this day. So you and I as believers in Christ, we identify with Christ in his death. God no longer sees us as sinners. God no longer sees us as condemned. And think about it, for the Jews that would come along and say, if I found a sinner that makes Christ the minister of sin, this is actually one of the greatest objections against that. Because I think what Paul would say is, what he says here, my old self has been crucified with Christ. I'm dead to sin. That's no longer me anymore. Christ comes and he lives in me. And as we've been reading Dane Ortland in the book, uh, as we've been reading the book Deeper by Dane Ortland, I think he's done a good job of explaining we are now united to Christ. We left behind that old life. Look at what Paul tells us in Romans 6 that is the same language here. He says, therefore, 
We have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that way we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. And so we are enabled by our union with Christ. And and being united to Christ, God gives us a new nature where by the Holy Spirit, you and I are empowered to walk in Christ's ways. We have a new master. And as we walk with him, he continues to form us into the image of Christ, which is our sanctification. I think I gave this example before of our sanctification. Um, but if you think about it, our sanctification is like an uh, artist who has, uh, does marble sculptures. And the artist starts with a big marble block, and he begins to chip away at everything that does not look like the finished product he's trying to get to. And in the same way, when God opens our eyes to the truth of the gospel, he begins to chip away at everything that doesn't look like Christ in us. And so that anger that you struggle with, that frustration towards your kids you struggle with, the uh, lust you struggle with, the anxiety you struggle with, God begins to chip away at those things and forms you into the image of Christ. And the only thing that gives us confidence is we have this new union with Christ where God assures us in his words he will complete the work that he began in each one of us. It is assurance that God will complete the work he began when he saved each one of us. So we are united in his death. The second thing is who we depend on changes because of his death. Paul says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. When Paul speaks here of faith, he's not speaking of the faith we have uh, when we're justified. He's showing the changed life, right? He used to live a certain way, but now he lives by faith in Christ. Notice the progression from verse 15 to 20. Paul was justified because of his faith in Christ. And now, who he depends on is not the same. Now, he no longer is dependent on himself. He no longer puts trust in himself, but his life is committed to Christ. When I surrender my life to Christ, I hope that as you look at your life, it's the same for you. My life was never the same. It can't be the same. When you put your faith in Christ, your love changes You no longer love your sin, but you have a love for the Savior who you put your faith in every day. And so if your life is completely the same after giving your life to Christ, please examine yourself. See whether you really truly know Christ. We heard from R.C. Sprouls this morning, one of the scariest verses we hear. There's going to be people that come before Jesus and say, Lord, Lord. And guess what? He's going to say, depart from me. I don't know you. And I think part of what that is is um, maybe those people never examine to actually see, do I know Christ? Is my life committed to him? And I think our culture would hate a verse like this as well because as we talk about dependence on Christ, what does our culture preach? Independence. We push hard to tell people, believe in yourself. You got this on your own. And Paul shows the Christian life is about full dependence. It's about full submission to our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's life was not just justified by faith, but his faith, his justification enables him to depend on his Savior. Faith starts the Christian life and faith continues the Christian life. Mark 10, 15, I think is helpful when speaking on faith. It says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child 
will by no means enter it. If you ever uh, have been around a small child or you have small children, you will notice they trust without concern or worry. They just put their trust in what you say. I remember when Teresa's abuela passed away, we tried to explain to our daughter, Lani, what actually happened that she died. And so um, we told her she went to be with Jesus because she was a born again believer. And so she asked us questions about visiting her and when will she come back? Like she noticed like, no, she used to live at Irma's. She's visiting Jesus. When is she gonna come back and go to where she was before? And we obviously see that we know she doesn't have the capacity to understand death, but she just takes us at our word that her abuela went to Jesus. There's a beauty, right, in childlike faith that is the faith that Jesus tells you and I to have in him. And honestly, this isn't easy, right? As Paul mentions, you and I still have this flesh that we contend with every day, that we wake up and we have to fight against. We can't control our lives, but at the foot of the cross, Jesus calls us to have faith in his death for salvation. But he also tells us to have faith in our new life as we walk with him. And I believe I can only do this because I know I have a Messiah who loved me and gave himself up for me. The other thing we see is we are made aware of his sacrificial love for us through his death. If you notice, Paul could have just put this uh, in the present tense and it still would have been true, right? Jesus Christ who loves me and gives himself up for me. What's so amazing about this verse being in the past tense is it reveals God did not start loving us when we gave our life to him. I love the way Spurgeon put it here. He put, he said, Jesus loved me upon the cross. Jesus loved me in the manger of Bethlehem. Jesus loved me before the earth was. There was never a time where Jesus did not love his people. Believer, get a hold of the precious truth that Christ loved you eternally. The all-glorious Son of God chose you and espoused you unto himself that you might be his bride throughout eternity. Here is a blessed union indeed. Let us all have on our mind always that God loves me. However, I think often, time, often should be on our lips, God loved me. And I think we should allow that to transform you as you think about your old self, who you were before you came to know Jesus Christ. You know, I think back to before I was saved, in my depravity, a slave of sin, dead in my trespasses, God loved me. He knew all the backsliding I would do. He knew all my failures. He knew everything I would wrong him, and he loved me. He knew every lie I would tell. He knew the times I would get frustrated with people easily in my life. He knew the times where I would be slow, uh, I would be quick to speak and slow to listen. He knew the times where I wouldn't even trust him. And he loved me. He proved his love for me because he gave himself up for me. He loved me first. He did not wait for me to get my life together to love me. His love was sacrificial. His love was unconditional. His love was free. And again, I love how Paul personalizes it here, right? He could have said, uh, he could have said loved us and gave himself up for us. But Paul knew if I want real change, I must believe Jesus died for me personally. Jesus loved me. Jesus gave himself up for me. And so when Jesus died on the cross, it's wonderful to know he died for the world. It gives us all hope, especially as we preach the gospel, that he died for the world. But when you start to meditate, meditate on the fact when Jesus was on the cross, he was thinking of you. 
it changes your entire life. Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you, God, for your mercy. Thank you, God, for saving us. Thank you, God, for dying for us. What a love that our God has for us, that he would send his son, Jesus Christ, as a sacrifice on your behalf. Personalize that, brothers and sisters, as you read scripture. Christ died for you. Christ gave himself up for you. When he was on the cross and he said, it is finished, it was your sin, too, that was upon him that he had to die for. And so Paul ends just to remind us all one more time. He says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Christ died for a reason, brothers and sisters, and it's because you and I can never stand justified before a holy God. And so we depend on our Savior, Jesus Christ, to be our righteousness. We are not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus. So let me ask again, like I asked at the beginning, have you, believed, have you placed your faith in Jesus to save you from your sins? If you have not, let me ask, what are you waiting for? Today is the day of salvation. Give your life to Jesus today. It doesn't matter what your past is like. It doesn't matter how messed up you came. It doesn't matter if you've been coming to church and you feel like, I'm going to be embarrassed if I've been coming all this time and I tell them, no, I gave my life to Christ on this day. Brothers and sisters, uh, for those who don't know Christ, give your life to Christ. The message of the gospel, what's beautiful about it, is it offers hope to sinners. It is a hopeful message. His death is enough. The price has been paid. Your sin isn't too heavy for our Savior to carry. He asks simply, would you believe? And for all the believers in the room, starting tomorrow as a church for one week, we'll be starting a media fast as we remember our Lord's death on Friday and his resurrection. During this fast, we'll be cutting out secular entertainment in our life. And you know, the point is not just to cut out entertainment, but to free up more time in our day to give to the Lord as worship. In prayer, reading his word, reading other Christian books, listening to more preaching online maybe, um, spending time with another believer, serving other people. Today, we spent our time talking about justification by faith. And guess what? This week will be an opportunity for you to remember the gospel, to remember the cost of the cross, to remember your justification, the fact that God treats you just as if you've never sinned. Because... We are justified by faith, but what is our faith in? Our faith is in a man who died on a cross on Friday and rose from the grave victoriously on Sunday. That is what our faith is in. Meditate on this doctrine. Allow it to change you. Your position before God has changed. God has justified you. You are crucified with Christ. He loves you. And also, he loves you. I want to end our service with the Heidelberg Catechism on Faith. And as Derek has done with communion uh, many times, I will ask our congregation a question, and we will all respond together with the answer. It says in question 61, Why do you say that you are righteous by faith alone? Let's answer together. Not because I please God by virtue of the worthiness of my faith, but because the sanctification, righteousness, and holiness of Christ alone are my righteousness before God, and because I can accept it and make it mine in no other way than by faith alone. Let's pray. Lord, we want to stop and say again, we are grateful that you would save sinners. We are amazed that 
you would have a love for us that would send your son to die for us on a cross. And you knew that this would be, would have to be done for us, for our sins to be paid. Jesus, thank you for doing it. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving yourself up for us. And now help us as believers to live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave, ourself, gave himself up for us. Lord, if there's someone who doesn't know you, that your Holy Spirit is convicting, may they know for the first time today that they are justified before God Almighty and that when they stand before you in heaven, that Christ's righteousness will cover them. Lord, I pray that you will bless the rest of our time here today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.